<laughs> I'll just start out by, um, I was going to share a little bit more of my background and, and talk about what our, um, our plans are today, kind of what I'm going to cover and how this will be structured. Um, so um, I have been working with nonprofits and data management for about the last 10 years. Um, I spent a substantial amount of that time with the Data Bank, which is a CRM company that specializes in the nonprofit market um, based in Minneapolis. And um, did everything from like making the coffee and sweeping the floors to um, doing data migration and configurations to um, running their sales and marketing department, um, all kinds of different things there in, in my tenure there. And um, in the process, I got a chance to work with between three and four hundred different small nonprofit organizations, small, small to medium, I would say, um, a, a great variety of different mission focus, and um, came to a really good understanding of not just what the best practices were for um, for database architecture and um, features and kind of what the market was, but also like how um, data is really used well in organizations and what's necessary once you've got a great product to really leverage that to help you, in, in the case of CRM, to help you grow your supporter da base and um, be able to engage those people and, and kind of move them into a, a deeper relationship with your organization. Um, and I learned a lot about things like user adoption and, and all the, the human barriers to using technology well. So I incorporate that a lot into my work today at MAP. Um, I do, as, as I think I mentioned, I do database consulting projects where um, often I'll work with an organization over about an eight-week period to um, try to identify their requirements <coughs> and understand like what's the difference between how they're using data now within the constraints of their current tools and how they really could be using data to help their organization thrive. Um, I'll help them look at products and select one that is the best fit for them and then get launched on the road to implementation. Um, what I'm going to do today is give away all my secrets to you. <laughs> so um, if you would choose to seek additional help, I'd certainly be happy to talk with you about that, but I'm actually hoping that I'll give you enough of a foundation today that you at least have some basic approaches to be able to use to kind of start off on your own search. So, um, so this is my contact information, and with the slides, um, we can email this to you when we're done. So um, don't worry about taking curious notes. Uh, you'll, you'll get copies of this. Also, normally when I do PowerPoint presentations and when I do speaking like this, I just use a lot of pictures and not a lot of words. But in this case, I kind of thought you might want to capture some of this stuff. So. Unfortunately, this isn't the most visually stimulating presentation, but it's got a lot of really good details in it, I think. So that'll help help you remember when you're looking back on this later. Um, so this is what we're going to cover today. We'll, um, we'll look at just the basics of an effective approach to selecting software. Um, we'll look at, we'll look more closely at four popular packages in this market. Um, and through the whole thing, you know, we'll just try to um, think about like how, how do you really leverage every dollar you spend on software um, to improve your organization and give you information for better decision making. Um, and you know, maybe in the process you have had a chance to meet someone new here too. So that's always a little side benefit of these programs. Um, I want to start out with just a little check around the room of like what you already know about this. Um, so who can like kind of take a stab at like what's what's your idea of what client tracking and case management software is? What does that even mean? What are we talking about? I work um, in the school district and we use something called Infinite Campus to track the students. So basically keeping all of their basic information and tracking behavioral referrals and attendance and all that kind of stuff. So it would be something like that. Yeah. So if in your case it's students, it's not, you probably don't call them clients, but yeah. you're just tracking all the information about their interaction with the program. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I work for an agency that does housing for homeless adults as well as um, drug and alcohol treatment, so we have lots of both programs. And uh, the software package that we use is really meant to document on the clinical side the um, mental health and chemical dependency services that they use and mm -hmm. try to adapt to our housing side. Mm -hmm. 
So it hasn't had the flexibility to kind of handle both of those programs. Can I ask what it is that you're? Celerity. Celerity, okay. And that's not actually not one I'm gonna review, nor is the one you mentioned, and I, I wasn't even familiar with that one, actually. I think uh, a lot of schools. Okay, so that's kind of education specific. Gotcha. Um, who else is already using some kind of database software, some kind of package for this? We use Workforce One and Workforce One. Okay. So you must have some kind of jobs related to employment programs. Okay, but that's not what they're using it for. Oh, interesting. Exactly. <laughs> Anybody else using something already? Well, I know you. Go ahead and share with the group, though. Uh, so we work with, uh, we do collaborative case management software, so participant-centered collaborative case management software called Empower, and the north side of Minneapolis is using it um, for their north side achievement zone project, which is 27 agencies there. So we use and it's, it's designed essentially to be the second half of that, not as much of a CRM as we are building achievement plans for folks to be able to come out of recovery and deal with education issues, homelessness, um, you know, those types of things. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what can this type of software do for you? What do you know about that? <coughs> Why would you want to make this kind of investment? Pain capacity. Yeah, we would love something where we have um, tags because we get put kids into out of school time activities. Mm -hmm. So just being able to say YMC basketball and mm -hmm. there are all the students that are there mm -hmm. and keep current information so you can communicate with them, keep track of communication. With them. Yeah. Sounds like just to stay organized. Yeah, <laughs> that's the purpose it was there for you. Yeah, what about you? Um, tracking services and I have a few more um, thoughts on that here too, but like, so I think these are kind of the four major um, reasons that people invest in this kind of software, or um, sometimes they don't even um, go into it looking for this, but um, are able to take advantage of those once they become a little bit more sophisticated. So um, being able to keep track of just who's participating in what, and what are the places that the organization has touched them, services they've received, that kind of thing. Um, just getting like that good um, organi organized information about um, a, a client, service recipient, participant, whatever it is you call them in your, your organization. Um, and being able to provide better quality service by having the right information at your fingertips and being able to kind of coordinate um, care across programs, which I think is maybe something you're experiencing some challenging, challenges with. Um, is, uh, I mean, that's really valuable, and that's usually the main reason that people kind of start out with this. But then it also can give you the ability to spot trends that uh, might clue you into maybe needs that your organization is not addressing, maybe that nobody is. Um, so that's good too. And then being able to measure and evaluate, being able to test, like, you know, our, um, our organization exists to accomplish this item, and our logic model says that if we do these things, then this will be the outcome. Well, you can use your data to, to test whether that's true or not, to test that relationship between like the cause and effect. Um, and then it also is a way to tell your story um, to funders, to the community, um, to potential clients, um, things like that, to be able to have data as evidence of what you accomplished, what you've been able to do. Any other thoughts on that? I'm gonna zip ahead. So here, I wanted to just start out with um, kind of to try to help you get your heads around like how these databases work and how they're organized. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on, kind of I don't know that you can't touch or feel um, or see necessarily fully um, with database like architecture and structure. So this is kind of, this is really really basic. But um, this is kind of like one of the main ways that information is organized. So there's gonna be a service recipient that is often kind of in the center of everything and then you'll have different touch points with that person as they move through your programs. Um, so that might be intake, enrollment, so forth. Um, there also will be relationships between that individual, and this is um, my buddy Edwin, by the way, um, <laughs> between that individual and um, family members or household members, caseworkers, 
Um, maybe within your organization or maybe at another organization. Um, you know, so there's all this affiliation stuff. Um, and then there's also the evaluation stuff. So that might be assessments, outcomes, milestones that the person reaches, stuff like that. Um, and then beyond that, there's also your programs, which are kind of interwoven through all of this, right? Because you might have multiple programs that um, have their own assessments or enrollments, their own caseworkers affiliated with them, their own sets of clients. And so it's this whole matrix of different information. But I tried to kind of boil it down to something that would be easy to grasp here. Um, and to help you a little bit further in um, understanding how this might actually look and how it might work, I'm going to hand off to Adam um, for a little example. And um, he is going to show you client track, which is um, one, of the, um, one of the products that has the biggest market share here. Um, it's pretty popular. And um, there you go. And so I think that'll be a good chance to just kind of get the, the gist of this. So. I'm Adam Cowling. I'm a database consultant at uh, Matt Commonwealth. The Matt Commonwealth is a nonprofit based out of Minneapolis that serves other nonprofits. So we help out with uh, management consulting services, so we do things like IT, finance, accounting, and also client databases, uh, which is what I'll show you here. Um, so the database software that we use is called ClientTrack. ClientTrack is a uh, web-based database um, that can be run out of pretty much all your standard browsers, Internet Explorer, Chrome, Safari, Firefox. Um, so I'll log in here, give you guys a little, 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 little. <coughs> So we're actually logging into the uh, testing version of the site, so it's all testing data and stuff in here. Alright. So, one thing about um, Client Track is it, it's pretty easy to navigate. You have your uh, tabs across the top here, and these tabs will take you to different things. The um, Home tab, for instance, is specific to the user, um, so you'll see there's some news here, some information about our recent software upgrade. Um, agency administrators can update this information and communicate across users. You can also see I have some reminders I've set for myself and um, the list of clients I've worked with recently. You click over to clients, you'll see the information changes. This is called the dashboard. And you'll see uh, the last person I worked with here is Marie. <coughs> so needless to say, this is fake data. This is fake data. <laughs> um, so you can see um, some basic demographic information as well as contact information in that top space. Um, you can also see enrollments. Um, so programs that Marie's been enrolled into. See, she's in a food shelf and some other programs. You can also see services that have been applied from those programs. So she was enrolled in programs and then we associated services. Um, and also some goals that she has. So she's trying to attain employment. So why don't we go ahead and do an intake for a new client. So we'll add a new client. And um, this here is called a workflow. And a workflow will take you through different steps, different forms and assessments and that sort of stuff um, to help guide your users through um, an intake process and make sure they don't miss any information. So the first step here is we'll, um, we'll search. So maybe we'll see if uh, Peter Cottontail is in here. As long as we're doing silly test data, we can do that. Right? So there's nobody with the initials PC. Some basic demographic information. We'll calculate the age for you. Then you see when I click next, it'll take me to the next form of the process. 
Um, so as Karen was saying, one of the key relationships in a database, uh, a client tracking database, is the relationship between an individual client and the family they're a part of. And families might be households, um, clients might be you know, participants or students or what have you in your system. Um, so in this system, we'll first uh, search for a family, see if there's a cottontail pin in here. Probably isn't, so we'll add a new client, or a new family. It automatically names the family after the head of household. Enter the address, do a little zip code lookup. Maybe this is a one parent household. Got some kids here. So this here is the family address. We also have um, some space for client contact information. If the mailing address is different than the family address, maybe there's a forwarding address, something like that, you can record that here. It's the same as it will often be, just click copy. And next. So the next section here is demographic information. A lot of times, um, either out of the way you run your programs for doing outreach to particular populations, or maybe you want to see who you're serving and who you're not serving. Maybe you have funders that require certain demographic information. Um, you can record that in this section here. This here's the federal uh, ethnicity category for Hispanic or non-Hispanic. Um, this here's a list of all the United Way races, all the United Way of Twin Cities, which clarify. It's a multi-select, so if you have people who are of more than one race or ethnicity, you can record that. You can also set up uh, rules for ease of data entry. Let's say maybe figure speaks Arabic. And if English is limited, if you click yes, it'll give you the opportunity to um, ask if you need to translate. This will keep you know your forms and stuff from getting bogged down with a bunch of fields that may or may not apply to any given client. You can also ask um, Questions specific to your organization. Um, so maybe you know you want to see if people are veterans or not, or track their housing type, that kind of stuff. Next, we'll add uh, families or um, some family members. Maybe there's a, it's got a kid. So now we have both Peter and Junior linked together through the family, so they're related in that way. You can also record things like uh, financial evaluations, so you can track uh, family income. Maybe that's one of your eligibility criteria, something like that or you're just curious to see who you're serving, you can record that kind of stuff. And this here will uh, also calculate the family income in relation to the federal poverty guideline, um, as well as area median income. So that can be kind of good. So now that we've gone through the client intake, it'll ask you whether or not you want to uh, enroll the participant in a program. Um, so we'll go ahead. Maybe they're coming in for uh, food support. <coughs> and also, another relationship you can manage here is uh, the case manager or caseworker. Um, so it defaults to the current user, but you can look people up with maybe somebody else who's actually the case manager. You can also associate documents with the participant. So if there's particular documents you need to keep track of, um, you can record those. Let's say, what type of document it is, whether or not you have it on file. If you're interested in tracking expiration dates, you can do that too, maybe your license expires next year. If you're interested in going paperless, um, you can also do some archiving, um, so you can browse and upload a, a file. Keep client records all in one nice, tidy place. So there was a short version of the income form before. Uh, if you want to track by income type, you can do that. 
Uh, client track also has the ability to chart and graph uh, client data. Um, so this, if there was more than one financial evaluation, you'd actually see income over time. You can also do custom forms, like food shelves, for instance, have a TFAP form that they're required to collect. I'll just kind of go through that quickly. And uh, there's also the ability to enroll all family members into the same program at once, so you can get credit for serving all of them. Um, so since food shelves are family programs, we'll enroll all family members. And we can then apply some services to Peter and Junior here. So we'll select both of them. Give them some food. And this way we'll get credit for serving both of them with our program, and we can track that. But we don't want to double count, so I'm just going to give the units to the head of household. <coughs> What did the units say about? That was uh, food in pounds oh, on that pounds. particular one. But uh, pounds, dollars, hours, mm -hmm. minutes count. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can set uh, databases up to manage that data. So now that we've gone through all of those steps in that workflow and um, created some relationships and enrolled them in programs, applied some services, we can click finish. And you'll now see that information show up on this dashboard. You want to go back in, and you know maybe there was some something you misrecorded in that enrollment. You can click right on the dashboard to link to edit that, add services, that kind of stuff. Hey Adam. Yes. Could you just show us adding a case note? Sure. Do that sure. A lot of this stuff is very structured, and it's customized to the organization that's using it. But then there's also mm -hmm. some kind of more free form entry that you can do. Yeah. Um, so. Do maybe a family case note since it's for the whole family. We'll select the uh, program we want to associate it with. And there's a regarding line, it's kind of like the subject of an email, maybe food shelf. It's a there's a particular topic, we can do that. Um, and you can select templates, but it looks like in my demo. Work group here. I didn't set any up. But when you do that, that'll kind of pull up a form to fill out within the case notes, right? So that's a pretty cool feature. There's a rich text editor, so if you want to do bolds and underlines, that kind of stuff. And the template um, would give you, like, you know, a headline, heading, might have the date, might have some other features, that kind of stuff, areas you're supposed to fill out. Put any kind of thing you want in here. There's the ability to do bullet points, um, a lot of different cool stuff. I thought you were going to put in like took 35 pounds of carrots. <laughs> <laughs> you good. <laughs> so that's a real quick case note there. And then for that client, you'll if you go to the case note screen, you can see all the different case notes and look them up. And also set um, time it time limits for how long they can be edited afterwards if you have certain compliance requirements with case notes, that kind of stuff. So after you get all this data in here, you've created relationships, you've enrolled them in programs, that kind of stuff. Another key thing with databases is you need to be able to get that data back out to report on it and understand better um, the people you're serving, how well you're doing on various different metrics, or report to funders. So ClientTrack has a pretty uh, robust suite of um, reporting tools. There's um, these standard reports that we create. They're a little little fancier. Some of them come from ClientTrack. Um, so you can do things like, let's just look at all of the people who've been enrolled in programs this year. There's only a few of this testing. So it'll pull up all the different programs. It'll show you who's enrolled, people have exited, that kind of stuff. And you can drill down and kind of at a glance, take a look at all the different people who've been enrolled in programs. There's some demographic reports. There's service reports, goal reports. You can look at all the different types of data you enter into the system. 
I so, know with more simple data tracking mechanisms like Excel, Access, whatever, the duplicated versus unduplicated counts are really a challenge. And so this type of system will take care of that for you. That's a good point. Um, and then in addition to these standard reports, uh, there's also a uh, custom reporting tool called Data Explorer. And Data Explorer actually allows you to um, go into individual sets of tables. Um, so, but it, you don't have to actually know the exact layout of all the different tables and the structures to be able to use it. Uh, for instance, this client demographic cloud that you see here has all the information from the intake. So you can select the fields that you're interested in and plop them in. And you can also link um, those domains, that's what they're called, so there's the client demographic domain. You can link it up with things like enrollments and services to do some more um, detailed reporting. So maybe I want to see my programs. You can also do things by, um, like if you right click on these, you can do counts and um, sums, standard deviations if you want to get into that, averages, that kind of stuff. So this is a, a very, very simple setup here, but we'll just click show me. And it'll pull you up all that data for you. There's also, um, as of um, a couple months ago when we upgraded our software, you can also do some charting and graphing within the tool. So if we wanted to look at, um, I think I can pull it from there again. Maybe gender program. That might not be the best one to do. Sorry, I didn't set that up very well. all of these platforms will let you export to Excel or a text file or whatever, so you can manipulate the data and create charts and graphs in, on your own, too, outside mm -hmm. of the program, but, um, but most of them have some graphics capabilities built right in. And I didn't pick the best uh, yeah. example there, so it didn't work that way. It's um, a challenge to do that on the fly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's kind of a, a brief flyby of sort of what a relational database might look like and some of the features of the client tracking software specifically. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for doing that. Yeah. So um, while we're switching around, I just want to ask, in the evaluations for this session, I'd be really interested in your feedback on how this part of our presentation worked for you. I've done this before um, at a conference. I've done kind of a similar presentation on this topic, but did not have a demo component at all. Um, and um, I'm kind of wondering, was this really useful? Is it worth incorporating the extra time to be able to do that? Or could you have understood things just as well without it? I guess you won't know because you have only had one of those experiences. But anyway, whatever you can tell me about that would be helpful. <coughs> and thank you, Adam. I, um, my hunch is that um, it is helpful it just like right towards the beginning of this to kind of get a look at something. So OK, so now we're back here. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit more broadly, we'll shift gears here, about um, some of the, the tools that are out there and um, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, direct you <laughs> to Brian over there later. But um, okay, so client track we already talked about. Um, there are actually a lot more than this and if you mentioned one that I don't think is on the list, you mentioned one, um, there are tons and tons of products that are designed to do this sort of thing. It's a pretty fragmented market. Um, most of them are um, SaaS products, which um, that's kind of a little jargony, I guess. SaaS stands for Software as a Service. And what that means is that rather than getting like the old-fashioned disk that you install in your computer and then that software, like you own a copy of it that lives there, you're accessing it through the web, like, like Gmail or uh, you're familiar with a lot of those kind of tools. 
So, um, so usually rather than a big upfront cost, um, well, there still might be a substantial upfront cost for um, customization, but then you'll have an ongoing subscription cost that's maybe monthly or quarterly or annual um, for service and for the company that's providing the software to continue to maintain it, provide continuous upgrades, backups, um, and hosting so that it's available to you online everywhere. Um, there are um, a few of these products that are moving a little bit more toward more like all-purpose data management, but many of them are very focused on a particular niche market. So one that's um, that's kind of trying to be all things to all people is Apricot, I would say, which is a um, product of CTK, a company that's been around for quite a while, and I'll, I'll cover that a little bit more later, but they do provide some, um, some features for donor management and volunteer management that um, so most of the other products in this market are not quite as strong on, um, or maybe don't have it at all. And then um, some of the ones like, let's see, service, for service Point um, specializes in social service agencies, um, particularly those with government contracts. It's got some special features for <coughs> interface with that. Um, Therap, CareLogic, and Procentive are all kind of focused on behavioral health. Um, which is actually a pretty big um, market as far as financial capacity, um, but not actually a lot of clients for any of them. I mean, there's some of the, the companies listed up here might only have 50 organizations that are actually using their software. Uh, some of the larger ones have thousands. So, and what else? Uh, there's a new one on here that um, wasn't on here last time I did this presentation, which is Freeform. That one has kind of just entered onto my radar. That's an open source product. Um, they're out of Canada, and it's built on the Formulize platform, which is um, kind of a like underlying layer of, of database. And um, if you're familiar with City CRM, more in the, um, the supporter management world, it's kind of like that. It's, um, it's open source, it's extremely flexible. You can kind of make it what you want to be. Um, the software itself doesn't cost you anything, but you can spend as much or as little as you want on having somebody help you configure it and support it and, and that kind of thing. So um, talking with the folks from Freeform, they said that on average, people are spending about $15,000 on it, even though it's not free. So <laughs> we'll talk about that issue in relation to Salesforce later, too. Um, and so now I want to transition into um, an approach to choosing software, and um, so this is where I kind of give away my secrets about um, about a structured, deliberate process, and I, I think that is a good way to make sure that you're um, knowing what to expect and getting a good return on your investment, and not just kind of like buying the first thing that you come across, or buying the thing that your board member's cousin is familiar with, or, or whatever, you know. You want to be a little bit more thoughtful about it. So we'll start out with um, just kind of um, Seeing if your organization is even ready to embark on this. Um, I've seen some organizations kind of like invest in a database before they have any capability to take advantage of it. And that's like just throwing your money down the toilet, if you ask me, you know. Um, if you're not ready to use it, then it's like the treadmill that sits in your basement and collects dust. Uh, so um, I'm working with an organization right now that is looking at this, and I want to kind of use them as an example here as we go through this. They started out um, meeting with me and kind of talking about, like, do they understand what, what they need to track? What kind of information is important to their funders as well as to their quality of services? Um, what pieces of data are really most important in, in measuring their outcomes and their impact as an organization? And um, after my first meeting with them, I was convinced that they really have that nailed down. So that's a big step in the right direction. Um, if you haven't put any thought to that, then I would say do that first. Take care of that business first before you start looking at software. Um, another thing is a culture of data. Um, now they had a little bit of um, inconsistency with um, people entering data in the same way and, and in a timely manner. Um, but that was, I think we concluded more because of extreme difficulties with the software platform that they were using um, than, 
than lacking like a culture of data being important and being used in decisions. They did have that. So that's an important success factor too, if you're going into a, uh, a change like this. Um, and then also, it's important for you to understand what your funder requirements are, what other kinds of um, places you need to report to, so you know what your, what your data management requirements are going to be. Um, and go into it with your eyes open about how much time this is going to take from you. Um, with, with my client KOM right now, they're, um, they're planning to spend about three months with a person dedicated for 10 to 15 hours a week on the database project. Um, and they're getting a great deal of service from their vendor on the implementation, but they still need somebody within their organization who can provide the right, the right information to that vendor to be able to configure things, that can test everything, you know, kind of do the acceptance testing, make sure that everything's working right. Um, so it's, it's a big investment of time. And it's not just that database administrator in your organization, it's everybody who is going to be using the software, and you can expect to have, um, just like any change, a dip in productivity for a while as people are learning and adjusting, um, some griping is going to happen. Um, there's also, even though um, a lot of times people express that like they can't wait to get rid of their old system, they're so frustrated with all these spreadsheets, whatever, um, if you look under the surface, sometimes you realize that like, my spreadsheet gives me the sense of control. I own that, people have to come to me for it. You know, so there's like this gatekeeper thing, there's control issues, there's power involved with data. And so like that's something you need to understand, I think, too, <laughs> to be successful with this. So enough about that. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about the next thing, which is really getting into what your needs and priorities are. So that's about um, you know knowing what what your goals are um, as an organization and for database to, for data management, um, kind of taking inventory of what you've got right now, um, how do all your processes work, and just documenting everything, um, and also think about like okay when, if we're gonna make this investment like what are the things we're not doing and put put some boundaries on it because otherwise the scope of a project can just get completely out of control. Um, so it's it's tough sometimes to go into it with a specific budget, but at least having some idea of like what's your upper limit um, might be helpful. Um, reporting requirements can be um, really, really key too. If you start with that end result, like what is the report that I need to get out of this at the end, and then work backwards from there, that's usually a, a good strategy to start documenting requirements. Um, HIPAA might be important to, to some of you, so that's some questions to ask about some of the systems too. And I know there's some um, specific re reporting requirements, like if you're, um, oh, if you're like part of the food um, systems in Minnesota, or um, medical assistance, or MFIP, or like literacy programs, you know, there's a lot of them that have some kind of um, reporting requirements that are specific to that type of agency, so be aware of that too. Um, and then here's just a few extra tips for needs assessment. I, I won't uh, belabor this point, but um, with, with stakeholders, um, when you're trying to understand what your data management needs are, um, I would suggest that you make sure that whoever enters the data is involved with that discussion for sure, but, um, but then other people who, who use it too. Um, and even look at people who are like filling out forms um, and what's that process like for them? How might you be able to streamline or improve that experience um, as part of your client service? Um, with, the, with the KOM project, we had the executive director involved in most of the key meetings um, with this whole project. Um, the database administrator who's like their Director of Administration, I guess. That's not actually her title, but that's essentially what she does. Um, and then there were three program directors that were kind of on the, on the data team. And between all of them, they had some really good input and perspectives on things. So, um, we generated a 12-page document of like just documenting all their requirements because they didn't have anything documented. It was all in people's heads. 
Now you might have that already, but um, but in their case, they just didn't have a road down anywhere. So that was an important part of the process. Um, not necessarily how something needed to be accomplished, but what what the end result needed to be as far as like what kind of reports do you need, um, what processes need to be supported. Um, I mentioned working backwards before. What else? Um, some good questions might be like, where's an unmet need? Where's a gap in service delivery that um, that this database needs to help support? Um, and what data could help us make better strategic decisions um, or improve quality of care? And what's the data we need to really um, know in order to decide about resource allocation? Um, and then the hardest thing is to prioritize because you're going to have a laundry list of, you know, here are the 300 features that I want to have. Well, okay, you're probably not going to be able to get 100%. So what's most important? What's second most important? That was the hardest thing with, with KOM is they said, well, ease of use is important, affordability is important, security, and reporting. Like all four of those things are important to us. So then when there are trade-offs, which one wins? You know, like, are we willing to pay $500 more for um, a security feature or, you know, so it helps to have a discussion about that up front before you start looking at products, I think. So you go into the demos with, with a clear head about um, what you're willing to compromise on. Uh, and then this is, a, this is really hard for you to read, but I can send this to you afterward if you want, um, or a, a version of this. This is their evaluation sheet that they use. So they had um, kind of their major um, decision criteria there. Um, and then they had a bunch of specific features that were like, these are not deal breakers, but they sure would be nice to have. And they compared their products. Um, and they gave a sheet like this to each person who participated in demonstrations um, and let them all kind of make notes of rank and stuff like that. And that was a nice way to structure things. Uh, so speaking of, of demonstrations, um, you will probably find that with most of these products, they have some kind of recorded demo or a webinar that you can do just on your own time to kind of get oriented to it. And that'll probably cover things like what Adam did before, um, you know, kind of like here's the general sense of how an intake and enrollment would work, um, some reporting, stuff like that. And uh, those are usually maybe like half an hour to an hour. Uh, but then that is not going to be enough to make a decision. So after doing that, you'll want to get your whole group together and have a personal, private demo with a sales rep or, or whatever. Um, and I would say allow about an hour and a half for those, for the actual demo time, and then an extra half hour at the end, actually at least an extra half hour, maybe even a full hour, to debrief just with your team and talk about it while it's fresh in your mind. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that people make with demonstrations is like, they, they all do it, and then everybody has to rush to their next meeting, and then you talk about it a week later, and everybody's like, oh, I don't remember if it had this thing or not, or what, you know, or you get them all mixed up, so, so that's really important. Um, another thing is um, to expect that a lot of that being in Minnesota is probably going to happen by um, some kind of virtual meeting, um, maybe web conferencing, because, um, like, Mac has people here that support client track. There are a few other companies that have somebody locally that would be able to do an in-person demo for you. But for the most part, they're based outside of Minnesota. And so you're probably going to be interacting with somebody uh, virtually. Although there are there are reps that come to Minneapolis and St. Paul a few times a year at least from all the major companies. Um, we talked about kind of who should be on the team for participation. Use cases. I don't know if that's a familiar term or if that's just like, because I kind of work with databases a lot, but, but that's just my thing. But um, use cases are um, like kind of scenarios for how you would use the database. So a use case might be like a, uh, a client comes in as a walk-in, and we need to have them fill out some forms and figure out what they might qualify for and enroll in a program or whatever. You know, So it's, it's kind of a series of steps that you describe and then uh, it's, it's really helpful to provide those to the vendor reps in advance so that they can walk you through a demonstration that is really specific to your situation. And I think if you're going to spend as much as these systems cost, you can expect that um, they're, they're probably going to be willing to do a little bit of customization for you.
to be able to show you a really strong demonstration instead of just showing you something totally generic and kind of canned. Um, and this is just a, kind of a laundry list of some features that you might be looking for. Um, I want to highlight the first one. Support is so, so, so important. Um, because, I mean, you're probably not going to have a database expert on your staff, at least not somebody that's really like the architecture coding kind of person. So um, having somebody you can go to to help with that stuff is, um, I think, worth a good extra bit of investment. Um, and, and good quality training, too, is important. Um, with mobile access, uh, more and more, I'm seeing people use tablets in not like a human service setting. If, how many of you are having like your caseworkers or people like that use tablets? Yeah, um, I'm I'm seeing that like all of a sudden just take off. So um, I I think that's a good feature to to look for. Is like will this work on um, on a tablet or or maybe even a mobile phone? I mean, sometimes we see that to be able to at least like look somebody up or enter a quick case note on a, on a mobile phone. Um, what else? Um, flexibility in what constitutes a household or a family is something that I think kind of separates the decent ones from the really good ones um, as far as features. Um, and then also the data visualization tools, I know you just added more to that. Um, I'm seeing a lot of the systems in the last two years having really enhanced that a lot. Um, as, um, as people become more sophisticated with just using technology in their everyday lives and so many free tools are out there for making like infographics and, and all that kind of stuff, I think that's just more of an, an expectation. And, um, and some of these tools have really good data visualization stuff that'll just like zip out a beautiful report for you. Um, integration can be, um, kind of depends on how you want to use this and you know, like how important that would be for you, but some have integration with, um, with email, um, web forms, stuff like that, and billing and timekeeping systems actually as well. Um, and, oh, and I've even seen a few that do um, swipe card or barcode integration, which also can be really nice depending what setting you're, you're working in. And then proposals. So this part is kind of boring, but um, when you get a proposal, you want to just look for some of these basic components. And I mean, read the proposal, for the love of God, <laughs> read the proposal before you like sign an agreement with somebody. Um, and, and maybe even have your loyal, your lawyer read it. Um, some of the things to look for, like in the, the legal side, or, or like little details in the proposal, are um, service level agreement. Um, most of them will not include that unless you demand it, mm -hmm. but it's sometimes negotiable. So service level agreement means like we guarantee that our system will be available 99% of the time. Which if it's web-based software, then I mean that's that's about standard 99% of time. Um, and you know, if it's down, then like you have no access to your database. So that's that's a pretty big deal. Um, so what you want to look for in a service level agreement is like what happens if it's down for more than one percent of the time, and we have a big loss of our ability to serve our clients during that time or whatever. Like, what's our remedy for that? Um, so. That's, that's something to think about. And just like ask some questions about the reliability of their system. What is their actual record for, um, for uptime and, um, and also for support? Like um, everybody will tell you, you know, our, our goal or our standard is to answer support requests within half an hour or two hours or, you know, whatever it is. But um, what you want to know is what's their actual history. <laughs> uh, that's, that sometimes tells you more. And you can find that out directly from them, or um, you can find it out by talking to client references. And then, finally, you have to have to make a selection. So I think it's really helpful at that point to just go back to um, your needs assessment and um, what your decision criteria were, look over all your demo notes, spread them on the table with the whole team, you know, and, um, and just try not to be seduced by the salesperson too much, um, even though I have been a salesperson, and I can tell you a lot of people bought stuff for me because they liked me, 
and I asked about their kids and you know or whatever which I mean that happened and it but you don't want to make a bad decision just because like you like the salesperson you know so um, so just check yourself on that um, and you also when it when it's all said and done um, you know you'll have some um, some facts about the features and the costs and that kind of stuff but you also have to kind of think about like am I really comfortable working with these people because during the implementation and long-term support, you're going to have this company that, like, you're really entrusting one of your most valuable assets to, um, which is, like, your your records of your clients and services. And um, you, I think you need to have a certain level of trust and comfort with them, too. Um, and check references. And I, I do have a list of, like, suggested questions to ask client references if you're interested in that. Um, and okay, so now let's talk about money. Um, there are a few different um, costs to, to think about here. I, I mentioned this before, but there's usually some kind of upfront cost. Um, it can be as low as like uh, maybe a little south of a thousand dollars, or it can be fifty thousand dollars. You know, kind of depending on the size of your organization, how much, how complex your needs are. Um, what to go with, so there, it can be all over the place. Um, and uh, so I'll share a few more specifics about some of the products as we go along here. Um, data migration, I think, is kind of the wild card there. Um, often there's kind of a set fee for um, configuration, like um, customization of the basic package. Uh, but then, and there's like a quick start package, or they'll call it something like that. Um, and then to import your data, you might be able to do that yourself, or you might not. And if you need assistance, it's probably done at an hourly rate, and who knows, you know, so that's kind of the, the unpredictable part of it. Um, usually, if you need assistance with data migration, like moving your data from your old system to your new one, you can send your data in advance to the vendor, and they'll give you a quote on it, so you know what you're committing to. Um, and also think about like the lost productivity and stuff like that as a cost and, and what kind of resources you're going to have to put to it. Um, the ongoing costs, like I mentioned before, are usually some kind of subscription or license fee. And uh, sometimes a support contract is included in that, just all bundled together. Sometimes it's a separate agreement. Like I know with, um, with Apricot, they have these different support tiers that you can choose from. And um, tier one is like included for free, but then you can get the gold or the platinum or the super diamond level or whatever it is, you know, for an extra charge. Huh. And then also there are some, some costs that are often involved with um, just ongoing training. Like say you have your database <coughs> administrator or your staff trained in and then a year later somebody leaves and you need to get a new person trained, well then that's, you know, maybe going to cost you extra to send that person to training. Um, or just revisions to the database. Um, you're almost inevitably going to have to do some revision after a year's time. And so, you know, that's something to just budget for as part of the cost of ownership. As well as data hygiene, you may need to um, invest a little extra in, like, maybe annually just kind of cleaning, standardizing your data if there aren't tools in the system that kind of continuously do that for you. And I see you taking notes, Louise. That would apply to actually any kind of like donor management software or um, you know any kind of database. And then finally, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to stop talking pretty soon. <laughs> Let you guys talk a little bit, check in with me. But um, once you've made your decision and you've signed the contract, you still have a lot of work ahead of you, obviously. Um, so um, establishing like training plans. Um, a way to kind of introduce this change to your organization um, in a way that people actually like embrace it and use it is it's important to be deliberate about that. Um, having data entry and data maintenance policies is also helpful. You might have kind of a um, like a handbook for how how you enter data if it's if the database tool doesn't force it into a standardized format. Uh, like with addresses, you know, do you use AVE or AVE period or do you spell it avenue? Just little things like that. You'll probably have some, some data standards within your organization to keep everything consistent. Um, and, uh, and cheat sheets um, for different processes and stuff like that. 
Um, another thing is, like, aside from the use of the database itself, um, this is sometimes a good time to train people to do documentation of their work properly. And um, you may or may not have a standard on that, but um, I mean, I know like if you're entering case notes for um, a mental health um, council, you know, there's like, there's particular things that need to be entered in a certain way, those things get audited. So it's a good opportunity to just like enforce good documentation of the work as well. Um, and then the tune-up, um, I put requires pizza because I, um, practice I advocate is like doing an annual, just all hands on deck, data cleanup day and assign people little like deduplication tasks or just, you know, scan through all this stuff, make sure this, uh, like you're checking for exceptions and what you would expect in your data, stuff like that. And um, that's a good time to just have pizza and I don't know, possibly beer if your workplace <laughs> is uh, friendly to that. It's tough work, but it's kind of fun to get everybody involved in it too, give everybody a sense of ownership of it. And then before I, uh, I move into products, just one more thing to share. This is kind of a summary of like some of the, the pitfalls um, of database shopping projects and implementation projects. So and it, it's kind of funky alignment. Um, I tried to line them up. So like on the left is the wrong way to do it. And on the right is the thumbs up way to do it. Um, and I'm trying, I don't know, have you encountered any of these things in your work? What, what would you say is the most important? Um, staff and executive. Executive leadership and staff buy in the top two you have there. I've seen those are really important mm -hmm. for success. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'd say um, in, in addition to that is knowing, I, I think the most important thing you said is knowing your needs up front mm -hmm. um, with all this because a, uh, a lot of folks that we work with just don't and they look at things and they think it, it might be right. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of great systems out there. Client track's a great system, our system's a good system, but it's, you've got to have the right one for the right thing. Yeah. And then the other thing I haven't heard is, what we are hearing more and more is um, data bridges, building data bridges between mm -hmm. systems, because now um, there's a lot of grants that require certain specific data systems to be used, mm -hmm. and new systems need to have the ability to integrate or, or have data flow between those. Um, and so that's just another issue that's becoming more prevalent now mm -hmm. um, than it ever has been. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that, Kim? Well, I think the staff buy-in piece, mm -hmm. because um, and have staff participate in the process from the beginning, mm -hmm. so that you don't wait and say, oh, we've got new software, and then expect them to jump on board. Yeah. Um, because they will continue to use shadow systems, mm -hmm. you know, their own Excel mm -hmm. spreadsheets on the side, if they aren't fully engaged and don't really understand why it's important to have everything centralized. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Yeah, and yeah, that the whole rogue IT thing can be a signal that the tools you have are not meeting people's needs and you need to pay attention to the tools, or it can also be a signal that you haven't invested in getting people's buy-in and, and helping them learn. It's, it's not always easy to tell the difference. All right, so should we talk about products? Do that. So we talked about client track a little bit already. I'm not going to give you too much more attention because <laughs> I, I want to kind of balance it out a little bit. But, um, but here's just a little quick uh, data about client track. Um, they've been around for, I think, longer than any of the other major ones here. Um, they have, how many clients in Minnesota? Do you know? Or th that Mac supports? Uh, we support 16 organizations. Okay. Currently. Yeah. And I know there are others that work directly with Client Track. So the yes. deal is, you can contract directly with Client Track. Um, you're going to get different pricing and kind of like a different, slightly different version of the system. Um, or you can work through Mac Commonwealth, and then they have kind of a special deal which I think is really attractive. Um, good pricing and really good support 
Um, and the advantage of having kind of a user group locally. Um, but so, so that's really nice. Um, the pricing is, I got this from uh, Shane. So uh, there's no upfront cost if you go through the Mac. Um, if you go directly to client track, they are gonna give you actually a pretty hefty setup charge usually. Um, so no upfront cost, one to 10 users. So like small organization agency is $650 per month. And that includes everything. So unlimited support, they'll do the whole setup for you, they'll give you training and all that kind of stuff. So um, that's a, a pretty good value really. Um, and then 11 to 15 users, the next tier is 940 per month. Um, and then it kind of goes up from there. They also have a deal where if you have volunteers that need to use the system, that they get a, a much lower rate per user. Um, so, I mean, just with this one, the if you just compare, if you're doing a side-by-side -side comparison for like 20 users with um, with client track versus, say, Apricot, client track is going to look like it's a lot more expensive. But um, I would say, like, think about the value of the support and training to you, and just you know, really having that that local service, and um, and then you can make a better comparison. Yes? Um, an issue with the client track through Mac a, a few years ago was mm -hmm. that you could not import your existing data. Is that still true? Or can you import data from other sources? There, uh, client track doesn't do a tremendous amount of support for data migration um, from an old system to a new one. There is, we can do some limited importing. Um, some, well, so there are certain types of data that's a like conversation. We'd have to have a look at the data and see what was trying to be important. So most people start from scratch? Most do. We've had a couple of uh, data migrations. I think three organizations have done at least some data migration. I'm glad you brought that up too, because that's an important thing to know. Um, Apricot is uh, the next one I want to talk about. They are a little newer. CTK has been around for a while. It um, used to be called Community Tech Knowledge, and they had a, an installed tool that they sold for a while, um, a few other kind of permutations of this. Um, they came out with Apricot, I think in 99, it might be a little, little more recent actually that they launched Apricot, but that's a thoroughly web-based system. Um, it's, I would say like, a little less full featured than um, than client track or social solutions ETO, which I'm going to look at next. But um, it's for a small organization with a limited budget um, that doesn't want to do a great deal of customization or um, you know really fancy stuff. It's I think this one's a really solid value. Um, it's pretty easy to use. They um, they've been established for for long enough, and they've got a lot. They've got a big client base. Um, so they're getting a lot of input from users and have kind of figured out like what's kind of the common denominator where how do we design a system that will work for a lot of different people um, and uh, their pricing starts at 645 for setup um, and then usually organizations are paying more than that for setup but I mean that's kind of like the basement um, if you're having them do um, custom reporting and data migration and um, all that kind of stuff, you can, I, I think that um, a quote I got recently was including a two-day on-site as part of the implementation where they'd actually send somebody out, work with the organization to do all their configuration and stuff and do some in-person training. Uh, and that was about an $8,000 package. So, um, and then starts at $125 a month for up to five users and um, 11 to 15 users is $325 a month and you know just to give you kind of a sense of what their their price range is like um, altogether I would say with with any of these systems if you're kind of a small to medium sized organization you're maybe going to expect to spend ten to twenty thousand dollars over three years um, could be more depending on what what you want to do could be a little less too if your needs are pretty simple. It's not it's not small. 
And then I actually want to see if I can show this. Now, I'm not sure how this is going to work with the way I've got the screen set up, but let's just see. I'm going to, I'm going to burden you. Since people from Apricot and these others didn't get a chance to be here like Adam did, I'm going to um, make you watch their video. Except I don't know if we have, oh, we don't have sound. Hold on, hold on. have a sound thing on here, I think. Right? Will this work here? You know, um, unfortunately, there were some problems with the speakers. We can try it. That is if I have the right. Let's see. Should be the regular. Otherwise, I'll turn my computer up really, really loud. <laughs> they might have closed captioning as well. Okay. This might not work. I'm not getting anything here. I'm not getting any. Let's see if I can. Cheesy, but I should probably stop the recording right now when I tell you that um, every one of these companies is going to give you this big story about how, like, our company was founded by a caseworker. We really understand you. We care about nonprofit. You know all that, and, and they do. I mean, they're sincere about that. But every single one of them will, will tell you that, like, as if it's, it makes them different from everybody else. So, but I mean, essentially, you don't start a company like this unless you kind of have a heart for nonprofits. Um, okay. Let's see if I can get this to like unfreeze now. Ah, okay. So here's the next one, and I've got I've got another video for you too. Um, so this one is ETO, which stands for Efforts to Outcomes. Um, the company is Social Solutions. They have been around for about as long as Apricot, and um, they have um, almost 4,000 clients. Um, with many of these, that when they give you their number of clients, that might not actually mean that's the number of accounts that they have directly. Um, sometimes it's like bundles of clients. So they might have some kind of like consortium or an organization that has multiple locations or affiliates or chapters or something or, you know. So it's not always easy to get a fair comparison of the accounts. But, um, and I know Social Solutions is like that. Like they have some. Um, some multi-client contracts that are counted individually in that. That's a um, duplicate account, I guess you would say. Um, and they're pricing, they have a, a quick start package that's $8,000. Um, and that's a, a pretty good start to um, configuring all of your forms and reports and stuff like that. Um, they do an annual license fee. So um, starting price is $85.80 per year. And I believe that, I don't have it in my notes, but I think that's for organizations up to $1.5 million. Um, 
it's based on the organization's annual budget rather than the number of users, which is kind of something that's different about their pricing compared to most most of the other products. Um, and then they also have this big emphasis on the um, like outcome management and logic models and theory of change and all that kind of stuff and how that relates to data management. And so they've got this site called performwell.org, which is like an affiliate nonprofit site where they have a lot of good resources, which you can use whether you're a client of Social Solutions or not. Um, and they have like templates and tip sheets and um, research and you know all kinds of different stuff about um, about data management. So so that's a nice resource. Um, I've got a link to their website here, so when I email this to you, you'll be able to get to all of these. Um, one thing I know about um, Social Solutions is it doesn't work on all browsers. Most of the other ones are, are pretty browser neutral, but um, it does not work on Internet Explorer 10, so you have to like downgrade back to 8 um, to be able to use this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think it works on, I, actually I think there's a few that don't work on like Safari. They all, I, I believe they um, all except this one work on Chrome and Mozilla and Firefox, but um, yeah, but this one's like IE8 is your your ticket to social solutions. So if you can live with that, that's fine. Um, I'm sure they'll be making it compatible with IE10 pretty soon. Um, what else? Uh, I, I guess that's it about social solutions. I'm going to show you the video and then let me know if you have questions about these. Oh, sorry, I forgot. I have a couple screenshots from them. So this is their screen with like this client and um, it's got, this is a little small, I know, but um, it's got their um, assessments that have been done for her, with her. Um, they have this thing, they call it efforts, when there's like a point of interaction or some attempt to help this person, whatever. So this is recent efforts and then all the programs that she's enrolled in. And so that's kind of how they're organized. And then um, this one is a dashboard for a user, like a caseworker. So this has got um, the caseworker's recent uh, efforts and assessments and participants that, that are in their caseload. And then this is one of their reports. And they, um, they have a reporting tool that allows you to create some really beautiful branded reports like this. Um, it also is flexible enough that it allows you to create really ugly, embarrassing reports. So much power. <laughs> Yeah. Um, by the way, I think you actually have to drag the screen off into the right so that it gets to the desktop. I have to just oh, what? So grab the browser at the top and just drag it up into the right to this other screen, and then it'll play. <laughs> okay. Grab the browser. There you go. We're doing it. Going back. It might be behind that screen now. Thank you. 
manufacturer software tool. It's going to provide you with the expertise to be able to take full advantage of it, both by making sure that the tool is configured to meet your exact program needs, while also documenting the process so you always know where you are, where you've been, and where you're going. Social Solutions is a little more on the slick polish side with their sense of marketing. If you call one of their salespeople, they will call you every day. <laughs> they're they're really they're good. They're really good. They um, they're aggressive. So, um, but it's a, it's a good tool. And then okay. And then let's talk about um, Salesforce a little bit. And then I'm happy to take questions too. I mean, if you want to just interrupt, that's fine, or, or we can kind of do it at the end of this set. So um, Salesforce is, um, I don't know. I, don't, I never know what to do with Salesforce. Like, it's kind of different. It, uh, you know, Salesforce is like the biggest CRM in the world. It's, um, it's, this, it's a thing. Um, and, you know, it's got more than 100,000 clients worldwide. Most of them are for profit. But then Salesforce also has this nonprofit foundation that um, gives free licenses to 501c3 organizations. And um, they've been around you know, long enough to be really well established and not really solid platform. Um, so it's free but not free. And what I mean by that is they'll give you um, a free account with up to 10 user licenses. But if you need additional user licenses, that's going to cost you extra. Um, if you need help with configuring it, you're going to hire a service partner or a consultant to do that. Um, you might also need additional apps with it to do like um, special configuration for case management, for example, or um, some kind of form tool or reporting tool or whatever. So there's a lot of like add-ons and extensions to Salesforce that have an additional fee, either a setup cost or a subscription fee or, or both. Um, and then like all these extra services that you can get from, from a person or an agency to help you be successful with Salesforce. Um, so um, with Exponent Partners, that is the only um, consultant or consulting agency that I know of that actually has built a whole like layer of configuration on Salesforce that customizes it to have a lot of the same functionality as like ETO and client track and Africa. And, and those kind of things. Um, so they do the customization and support, and um, you'll pay them about $8,600 a year for that, and then they have a pretty hefty setup charge as well. Um, now, that's not your only option. You could certainly work with another Salesforce implementation partner and have them kind of custom configure things for you. Um, the advantage of working with something like Exponent Partners is that um, they are, uh, they've kind of worked out a lot of the bugs already. Um, they're just, they're offering something to you that has already been totally built out. They're just gonna tweak it a little bit to work for you and customize around their, your needs versus like, to get from Salesforce to client tracking features is a pretty big step. So they've already done that, then they're just gonna do that little additional step of customizing it for your needs and you know names of your programs and, how, and what your workflows are. Um, so um, I would probably only recommend Exponent Partners for an organization that is very large and complex and, um, and needs some of the, the power of Salesforce being like such an open, configurable platform. Um, I have a little deal here too. Human service agencies provide critical services to those most in need while facing some of the toughest technology problems in the nonprofit sector. With overlapping data, updated technology platforms, and rigorous reporting requirements, agencies like yours need a flexible and intuitive information system to accomplish your work. Centralizing data collection at Salesforce can free you up to focus on what matters and provide you real-time data to manage your performance. Let's take a look at an example of the Salesforce case management system in action. This is going to be really tiny for you, I'm sorry. And can set my customizable dashboard to view key data that I need to keep the 
organized, including by current caseload, tasks to complete by client, and critical incidents that may need my attention. Once in the system, I might begin my work by performing an intake with a new client. This flexible intake process enables me to enroll either an individual or an entire family on the same screen without having to duplicate similar information such as address for each individual. This intake form builder can be customized to capture both the universal data elements as well as those that are specific to each of your programs. Once an intake has been completed, you can use Salesforce's powerful workflow engine to send an email alert to a supervisor to request approval or assignment to a case worker. At intake, a case record is created which contains a 360 degree view of all of the client's activities. For this I'm demonstration, stop this. we'll follow Matthew and not watch the whole thing, but um, it's another like two minutes of this, but you kind of get the, the gist of it. And I'm sorry these are hard to see. Um, I, in retrospect, should have just embedded them in the PowerPoint. We'll do that next time. I'm always learning. Um, okay. There we go. So I'm back to this one. Um, okay, so. That is, oh, that's actually my last my last slide here, but I mean, now I just want to kind of open it up to you. We've got another half hour before the program is officially over, and um, I'd love to hear your questions, comments. You know, we can go back and look a little bit more closely at some of these products if you want. Um, it's up to you how you want to use the rest of, of our time here. So, what questions do you have? So I guess I've got a question. Um, <laughs> so when you're looking at different, you know, database solutions, how can you find like what type of solution is best for your organization? Like we've been talking about client tracking databases, um, but there are so many other particular types of databases, like mm -hmm. you know, membership databases, you know, fundraising databases. Like, is there a guide or like how would you recommend going about selecting what genre of database? You what should genre? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> question um, yeah I um, I think it's pretty difficult to find one tool that kind of does everything mm -hmm. so um, I mean if you're if you're an organization that kind of exists to serve people in some way you're probably going to need some kind of tool to manage this type of data right so um, I mean, uh, there are many, many organizations that are doing it with access and Excel or whatever, you know, those kind of tools. And um, and you might be able to do that just fine, depending on the size and complexity of the organization. But if you're really feeling like growing pains of that or like the uh, it's just not working for you, then that's maybe time to think about investing in something like this. Um, now, there's also, there are so many other different kinds of data, right? So there's... Um, in a human service organization, you're also going to probably have volunteers. Um, some of these systems will include some volunteer management features. Um, some as simple as just being able to enter volunteers and kind of a profile on them um, and maybe track some of their history. Some will actually let you do relationships between a volunteer and a program or an individual or a household um, and be able to really connect them directly. Um, that might be in the case of like a mentorship program or a tutoring program or something like that where there's volunteers involved. Um, and there's also, you know, kind of a whole other side of like CRM software that um, is made for managing relationships with supporters of the organization. And that might be donors, um, it might be activists or members if it's a membership organization, <coughs> um, things like that. And it's pretty rare to be able to find a system that can really do the people you serve and the people who are supporting you in, in one place. And there's often not a ton of overlap anyway, um, or even if there is overlap, there's maybe not a lot of compelling reasons to be able to have those systems integrated. Um, then you're also gonna have your like, accounting and all your financial data. Um, marketing, like email, uh, maybe there's website stuff, especially in the case of like an association or some kind of membership organization, you might have a website that has its own kind of database that allows people to update their profile or see a member director. I mean, there's just so many different things. I, I think that there's been a big, um, there's been a lot of talk 
and a lot of effort about integrating systems and like the holy grail seemed to be this all in one you know thing and and I'm starting to notice a shift in that I think that um, that people are starting to realize you know actually if you have the best tool for this and this and if they can sort of talk to each other as needed but not be totally integrated that might actually be just a fine solution I think it's important to check with other organizations that serve a similar client population as you do. Yes. Because someone mentioned mental health issues, and someone mm -hmm. else mentioned homelessness or housing issues. Mm -hmm. And there are databases that definitely do better on you know, housing or mm -hmm. mental health. Or, um, as I recall, the Mac version of uh, Client Track had some features for food shelves that they mm -hmm. had customized. So, you know, that's already built up for you if you do food shelf stuff. Yeah. So, um, check with other organizations that do things similar to what mm -hmm. you do and see what they're worth using and what works well. Yeah. You know, I have looked around on the internet for like reviews, some kind of consumer report kind of thing on this software. I've really found nothing, um, which is why I decided to do this workshop, because um, there just wasn't really anything good out there. Um, but if I were shopping, I mean, I certainly wouldn't just do like a web search for, you know, client tracking software or something. I'd start with um, with like industry groups or what, well, that's not really the right term, but um, you know, kind of with whoever your professional network is. Um, and they probably will have a listserv or a discussion board or something like that. You know, if you're a member of, of some kind of professional association, that's a great place to start asking those kind of questions and get an idea of, of what other people are using and, and just talk to your, your colleagues and peers locally. Thank you. Yeah? And don't forget the Math Tech Listserv. And don't forget the Math Tech Works Listserv, yes. <laughs> and remember, you know, LinkedIn used to have that ask a question feature. I use that all the time for researching stuff like this, and now they've taken it away. Mm -hmm. They have groups, um, tons and tons of groups mm -hmm. that you can join and be a part of and mm -hmm. um, ask questions. Just mm -hmm. and, I mean, some of these groups are like, you know, 1,500 people or, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. There's a lot yeah, of there's some really people mm -hmm. that are doing the same thing all around the world. And, mm -hmm. I know there's there's some LinkedIn groups that are specifically for nonprofit technology, um, and then there's other ones that are for like mental health professionals or um, you know there's all kinds of different ones. So that's a good source of information too. In fact, in the um, N10, which is the nonprofit technology network, um, it's like the professional association in nonprofit technology. Um, N10 has a uh, like online discussion group thing called M10 Discuss. And I posted, when I was getting ready for this, I posted like, what's everybody using for client tracking, case management software, what's new on the market, whatever. And I got like 20 responses, I think. And uh, that's how I found out about Freeform and a couple of other tools that I included here. So that's how I found out about Exponent Partners, actually, too. So you had mentioned I would get a little couple minutes to yeah, go ahead. Yeah, because we didn't really cover that, but because um. Empower wasn't in the list, it's just um, because it's fairly new, it's a lot smaller. So it would be to something like that. Um, we've got in the hundreds as opposed to the thousands of, of users. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially, the differentiators based on what you've seen is we do a lot of the same stuff. But um, Empower is is really focused on participant-centered case management, so it's holistic case management. Um, so there's 15 areas of life built into the system, and it's really centered around goals and steps and measuring your progress through those goals and steps. Um, and then the other differentiator would be our um, how fully collaborative we are. So the Empower system is designed to be able to collaborate community-wide. Um, so one of our flagship programs is North Side of Minneapolis, where there's 27 agencies there all exchanging data around everything they do between housing, addictions, and um, education, and they work with the school district. and. You know, we, we work with all those different agencies to be able to integrate data based on an extensive release of information, electronic release of information. So it's a little bit different in that, in that regard. Um, so we, we want to make sure that you guys are, are knowing about it, especially the ones that are here in Minneapolis, because it's already being used by those agencies, that it makes sense for others to also integrate it, uh, or at least be aware of it um, so that we can integrate stuff. So, um, <coughs> 
Oh, sorry. Say I that. just added it. Okay. <laughs> the um, so comparatively. So the version that you get afterward. There you go. So price-wise, it's it's very similar. It's a little bit less, but it's uh, very similar as far as it's um, about close to five hundred dollars a month as opposed to the the other numbers. So, and that's for five users, and then additional users is thirty dollars a month um, on top of that. So it's very similar, but um, it's just designed to to. You can see it here locally through the Northside Achievement Zone. And that's spelled M-P-O-W-R. M-P-O-W-R. And you can see it at, M at empower.com, so there's no E's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you dealt with any situations where agencies were merging or collaborating? Yeah, I mean, did you see that? Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't think of a specific example now off the top of my head, but I certainly see that happen. It's, you know, one of the things that I like about um, the way client track is set up through Mac, and some of the other systems can be done this way too, is the way they've incorporated like the Twin Cities United Way standard demographic data. Um, I think that's a smart thing to do if you're working with somebody in the same community. If you just go by like, if you've got a joint funder or whatever. Just make sure you get the um, the demographic stuff in the same format, and um, it's it's partly like being able to collaborate on how you configure your tool, even if you're on two different platforms, you might be able to get them to jive with each other a little better that way. Has anybody else seen that happen, or have any tips for kind of collaboration across agencies and platforms? Uh, so, okay. I just threw this up here so you could kind of see the overview if there's anything that like triggers. So, yeah, other questions you have? And you said this is recorded, it'll be available too, or how's that work? Yeah, Terry yeah, has the details on that. Yeah, so uh, we're recording it. We're going to put it up on YouTube and then post it on the website. And then since all of you signed up, I think with the exception of two people, um, you'll receive an email with a link back to all of that and Karen's slides as well. So we will follow up. Um, what was missing here? Is there anything else you were hoping to get today? How many people are going what, um, in the past, or what have you seen with agencies that are trying to employ, not employment agencies, but, mm -hmm. you know, we're a, you know, I'm from Ramsey County Workforce Solutions, so okay. we have a client-based system, but mm -hmm. it doesn't help with getting people employed like organizing that information and um, knowing um, who your, you know, who's your food service, who's your construction, who, you know, it, it doesn't enable you to do any of that. You kind of have to go outside of whatever system you're using to do any of that, and that's not mm -hmm. happening. That doesn't sound like a very efficient way to yeah. <laughs> keep track of things. So, yeah. Um, I mean, I don't have a lot of experience with mm -hmm. that kind of program, but um, I know that the agency that I'm in the middle of a project with right now that I kind of use as an example, they have employment services, mm -hmm. as refugee employment services as one of their programs. And so they're going to be setting up their database so that they keep track of all of the people that are enrolled in their program. Mm -hmm. And they have, you know, some details about, that, like, what are their skills, and mm -hmm. they're able to upload their resume in the certain system mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, and then they also have, um, in their database, they have employers mm -hmm. that they have a relationship with, and they're able to track even open positions and who was placed and mm -hmm. what the salary was, and they do, like, six-month check-ins, I think, mm -hmm. you know. So they've been able to kind of figure out a structure that'll keep track of all of that stuff. And it was important to them especially to be able to pull, um, not just by participant, but by employer, mm -hmm. like, um, you know, at 
ABC Industries, mm -hmm. how many people of ours have been placed in the last year, and how many have stayed for more than six months, and things like that. Um, can you make any recommendations for financial management systems then? Uh, the most common ones that we see are just QuickBooks and Peachtree. Um, and, okay. yeah. I'm sorry, I just, I just discovered a new one when I was looking under those same ones because we just, my wife and I just started a nonprofit as well. It's called Applos, mm -hmm. and it's an online version, and it does very similar things. It was targeted at nonprofits. You might want to look at that. Okay. A P L O S, Applos, mm -hmm. and it was. Have you heard of that, Karen? Nonprofits. No, that's new to me. That's yeah, it's it's it brand new, so well, it's mm -hmm. fairly new. It's within the last couple of years, I think. Yeah. It's just. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what system are they going off of? Do they already have a system that you're working with or your business like Yeah, they have not signed the contract yet, <laughs> um, but they're leaning toward Africa mm -hmm. right now. Yeah, and the, with their eyes open. I mean, I think they really understand like what what's is that you know what does that commitment consist of? Exactly. <laughs> what do I expect here? <laughs> Um, they're, they're giving up a bit of having everything done for them um, in order to save a little bit of money, but I think that's, yeah, I think that's a good decision for them. Yeah. Anything else? You guys talk amongst yourselves, or, or you can come up and chat with me one-on-one -on -one if you want. Thanks for coming, everybody.